new deck? Oh yeah, I cannot wait to pub stomp some casuals down at No Land Beyond with this bad boy. About that, I worry you're beginning to alienate some of the other players down at the shop. Oh, what, what, oh, that's great. I have to worry about alienating people. Nice one. In fact, Andy was starting to alienate some players at the local game store. Oh, you're just going to put your drink on the table? What if you spill it on my $3,000 EDH deck? Come on! Oh, yeah, the guy with the $4,000 deck's going to give up his seat in the pod. Come on! What, you think I'm just going to let you cut my $5,000 deck? Come on! Oh, sure, attack the guy with the $6,300 deck. I get it. Come on! And I swing at... Andy for lethal. Okay, okay, okay. So should 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 We're gonna make a podcast now. Oh baby, we're gonna do it. It's gonna be so good. Hello and welcome to Lucky Paper Radio. I am your host, Andy, and I'm here with my co-host, Anthony, usually right about most stuff, Maddox. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Anthony, I um, we disagreed about a thing a long time ago, and I've come around to your perspective on this thing. Oh my God, I'm so curious. And this thing is a rice cooker. Wow. Yeah. My wife wanted a rice cooker. Anthony had a rice cooker. And she was like, can we get a rice cooker? And I was like, yeah, if you want to, but I don't, I'm never going to use it. I'm just going to cook rice in a pan because it's not hard to cook rice in a potter pan. You just rice, water, turn it on the stove, turn the stove down. When it boils, you have rice in a certain amount of time. The thing about a rice cooker is that it, it makes it a little bit easier in terms of raw effort, only a tiny bit easier in terms of raw effort. But that's actually a decent percentage of the effort that goes into making rice. But the bigger thing for me is the keeping it hot and having it just ready whenever you want. Like, I can just get up now, throw some rice in the rice cooker, and then I can have lunch whenever I want because it's just going to be rice ready. I don't have to worry about it at all. You were right. That's and so the, was my wife. Although, to be fair, I wasn't always right. I was also a, not a denier, but I wasn't a, a, a proponent of rice cookers for the longest time because, like you, you just put it in a pot. But I was eventually turned around and, yeah. I mean, the thing is, it, it it's a little bit of convenience, but it's convenience at a time where you're trying to do a bunch of other stuff in the kitchen It's or, you know, or trying work. to focus on something else. <laughs> if you work it from home and need some rice for lunch. It just makes such a bigger difference. I mean, it's kind of like when we're talking about cards and we're like, oh, this has this like extra effect on it that doesn't really matter. It says, oh, can be your commander or whatever. It's like, yeah, when you're looking at that one card, when you're just trying to make rice, it doesn't make that big a difference. But put that in the context of a whole pack or your whole day where you're trying to do other stuff, that little bit of effort uh, really just pays off. What a segue, Anthony. I'm so impressed. On this episode of Lucky Paper Radio, we're going to be talking about whether or not synergistic magic and interactive magic are at odds or whether like a synergy deck and an interactive deck are fundamentally incompatible in some way or not this topic is inspired by uh, me watching all of caleb gannon's drafts he posted on his youtube channel of his own cube which was on mtgo for the past week it's off now and there's nine drafts posted at this point he might have sandbagged a couple but i've watched all nine of those videos on there and uh, i gotta say the decks he drafted from this cube are so sweet and it had me thinking about synergy versus interactivity but before we get to that topic we have to do a pack one pick one from a listener submitted cube this week's cube comes to us from donald k magic who sends us his balanced budget cube a 423 card cube that is all about keeping it cheap i also have to give a brief shout out to donald k magic for being the first one to actually submit podcast annotations for a previous episode wait seriously yes i didn't i actually did not make that connection for a wow. second here <laughs> what a uh, what a perfect I promise it's not that we're doing this cube just because Donald... I promise that we didn't plan ahead about making a podcast. Well, thank you, Donald, for that. I appreciate it. And also, we're doing a pack one pick one from your cube. Donald's, you know, got a budget restriction here, which, again, we don't talk about that much on the show because we know that our listeners have budgets all over the place. But certainly, uh, we are huge proponents of getting people to cube with the cheapest cards, whatever cards they have access to. And definitely believe you can make a engaging, exciting, powerful environment uh, without breaking the bank. And so I think this cube is a good example of that, that it seems like Donald has been working on for some time. So I'm going to read the contents of the pack. And then Anthony is going to tell us which of these budget babies he's taken pack one, pick one. The pack is Fiend Hunter, Light the Way, Explore, Iron Apprentice, Dream Stealer, 
Divine Arrow, Gloom Shrieker, Lunark Mantle, A Johnny's Pride Mate, Cinderclasm, Battle for Bredegard, Temple of Plenty, Magma Spray, Weaponcraft Enthusiast, and Mother Bear. What's it going to be, Anthony? I mean, you know this is my kind of cube. It's, it's really refreshing to open up a pack and be like, I know all these you know, cheap cards that I love. I think there's a lot of solid options here. I think what's drawing me in most is Dream Stealer and maybe Gloom Shrieker? Uh, so a lot of these cards are fairly straightforward in terms of being... Uh, I mean, that's maybe not even fair to say. I was going to say, you know, it's like a creature. It go, comes in play. You sort of know what it's going to do. The ceiling isn't that high. Uh, but the ceiling on the, those two cards is quite high. Dream Stealer just sort of being a built-in two-for-one because it has eternalized, so you can definitely cast it a second time. And then the opportunity, especially with Menace, to get in and attack your opponent multiple times and start getting rid of their hand, I think is pretty potent. And again, it comes back as a 4-4 four, four with Menace, which is really relevant. Gloom Shrieker, same thing, just as a, a cheap way to get some card advantage uh, is very powerful, I think. I agree on Dream Stealer, but I have two other cards I'm looking at, and Gloom Shrieker's not really on my radar. Okay. I'm not that interested in a three-mana 2-1. I get it that, you know, it's good value, but... It's, it's conditional value, right? If this was a, like, what's the white 2-1 that draw a card and gain a life from the newest set? Uh, inspiring Overseer. You can kind of think of this as an Inspiring Overseer. It's going to be a 2-1 that draws you a card. This one has medicine instead of flying. You have a little bit of control over the card you draw in the late game, but in the early game, maybe can't cast it because you're not going to get that value. I think it's a fine card, but it's not jumping out at me from this pack. The other ones that are interesting to me are Battle for Bredegard, just as a, you know, it's a three mana crate, four one ones at base. I mean, I guess they could remove some of your tokens before that third chapter goes off, but the opportunity to possibly copy some other stuff feels like a very powerful card that is pulling me in. And then Magma Spray. Magma Spray is just really efficient interaction, and I value that very highly. And so I'd be pretty happy here to start on Magma Spray. Also, oh, yeah, that's a great point. Looking at the rest of this pack, I see Fiend Hunter, Divine Arrow, Cinderclasm. These are all, I think, significantly powered back removal spells, either because of the designer's choice to do that or because of the budget restriction magma spray not that much worse than shock so those are three i'm looking at ultimately i am still going to take dream stealer though i I think the fact that this is a built-in two for one right the fact that it's a card that when it dies is going to draw you another card and quite a powerful card it's worth noting like the eternalized dream stealer is a huge threat that your opponent really has to deal with immediately but i also i really like this kind of uh of play where you have uh you play a cheapish creature that has potentially significant value if you can protect it and build around it um, that's something I've been pushing more in my own cube, and Dream Stealer, I think, fits perfectly here. It's also just a cool card that, you know, I don't get to play with that often, which is one of the best parts about budget cubes, I think. It highlights a lot of really cool cards that are maybe just, you know, a couple ticks far from the most powerful, most interesting version of a particular effect, but they have their own unique things that uh, that pull you in and make them worth your time. So I'm on Dream Stealer. Are you going to do Dream Stealer or Gloom Shrieker? Oh, I think, I think between those two, Dream Stealer is definitely a, a, a good chunk above. Yeah, and I was going to say exactly the same thing. Just uh, the the budget restriction is obviously it is relevant because if you're trying to build a cube on a budget, uh, you don't want to spend Which a lot of money. Everyone's trying to build a cube on a budget, right? The question is just what that budget is. So that's that's a, a obviously a reasonable and valuable feature of the budget cube. But this other aspect that it just is a restriction that forces you to dig into different cards and get to actually explore space that just isn't touched on that much because of what I guess we could sort of call the arbitrary nature of the fact that uh, magic cards have prices. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just cool to highlight different cards that you wouldn't otherwise get to see in most environments. Donald has one more follow-up question for us, Anthony, which is he wants to know a card that is under 50 cents that we think doesn't see enough play in cubes broadly or doesn't get enough respect. Do you have a card that comes to mind? So that is hard for me because I just love a lot of cheap cards. There's so many great magic cards that don't cost that much money. I went to my own main cube first thing and just searched on Cube Cobra with all the great search filters, searching and filtering features they have, uh, sorted by everything that was worth less than 50 cents. And it's like three quarters of my cube. And I want to just say all of these cards. Well, read them off. I'm, I'll all right, wait. here we go. I think I'm going to go with Future Sight. I think Future Sight is sort of a, a great confluence of being very powerful uh, while not being overpowered for a lot of environments because it is a little bit committal in terms of mana cost, but it's just so much fun to play with. So that's something that I always really enjoy playing in, in really any environment. Well, if I filter by that on Cube Cobra, it's only 31 cards out of my 360 card cube. That's different. So we have we definitely have some different cubes going on here. I would call out two cards we've talked about previously on our underrated cube card episode, which are Portent and Ulcerate, two cards I really like that are both very, very cheap and I think can see play in cubes of a broad variety of power levels. But we've already talked about those. Go check that episode if you want to check it out. I'm going to call out Rimrock Knight here. This is a little aggro creature that has just 
aged beautifully for me. And I love the fact that it's both an instant and a creature in and of itself, which is, of course, true of a lot of the adventure cards. But it's especially valuable on a cheap little threat. It's the kind of thing where, you know, there are certain two drops I don't really want in like a spell slingery tempo y deck if I'm playing like blue red or something. You know, some of the ones that really just, just have a body and there's no interaction or synergy with that theme. And Rimrock Knight being both is this really nice way to like have a little bit of synergy with the spell slinger theme while also just being a decent body on its own. It's another card that I think can hang at a ton of different power levels. Uh, it's also got the most beautiful. <laughs> I love the showcase frame from Eldraine. It's still one of my favorite card frames and the Rimrock Knight art on the uh, showcase frame is particularly beautiful. So that's my shout out for, uh, for the card under 50 cents. I think people should be playing more. It is very good. Thank you, Donald K. Magic, for sending in your cube. And double thank you for being the first one to help us with our annotation project. If you heard last week's episode, you hear Anthony mention the annotation project. We'll put it in the show notes again. Quick 30-second elevator pitch. We are trying to add cards mentioned and timestamps to the back catalog of the show. Early episodes did not have these pieces of metadata. And in order to make the episodes more accessible to a broader audience and people that want to pour over that back catalog, find specific topics, uh, we were trying to add those to those things. So if you want to listen to an old episode take a couple notes, and get some credit on the website. Check the show notes to figure out how to do that. Yeah, we've had a couple other people reach out uh, as well about that, and we appreciate all of you. So I told you I want to talk about this, but we haven't actually talked about it ourselves yet, so I don't know what your answers are going to be to these questions. But as I said, I've been watching all of Caleb Gannon's drafts from his own cube on Magic Online, which he's posted to YouTube. I watch a lot of Caleb Gannon's drafts on YouTube already. I imagine a lot of our audience already does that. If you don't, Caleb does have a fantastic YouTube channel where he has nice little relatively concise videos of him drafting and playing any cube that's on Magic Online. He also has some pauper content, other stuff on there. But that's certainly how Caleb has made a name for himself is by posting these cube draft videos. And it's a real joy to watch him draft his own cube that he designed, right? Because he's just giddy with excitement that he gets to draft his own cube on Magic Online. And, you know, he calls it Caleb Gannon's Powered Synergy Cube, right? It's a very synergistic cube. There's a lot of cards in the cube that really don't do anything on their own. They have to be in a particular context, a particular deck to function. And this is not the way that I have built my own primary cube, the Bun Magic Cube. People listening to the show will know that I really value flexibility. I really value cheap interaction, having a high density of interaction. These sorts of things that kind of make it difficult, I think, to also include highly synergistic pieces, right? And frankly, I love love some of the decks that Caleb has drafted from his cube. They are so cool, so novel. He's been abusing cards that I think a lot of people have never really seen abused in a cube before. At least I haven't. Like, he's drafted multiple decks with Bazaar of Baghdad, like a Dredge deck and two Storm decks that have absolutely abused the crap out of Bazaar of Baghdad in a way that is so impressive to me. And it just makes me look at these decks and wonder if I can pull some of that synergistic joy into my own cube, which poses me the question, Anthony, do you think that synergy and interactivity are fundamentally at odds? Nope. Sure don't. End of episode. Speak on We did it. (laughs) So my question for you is, what do you mean by interactivity specifically? A lot of the games that Caleb plays with his cube are a little bit like two players playing solitaire in the sense that it doesn't really matter what their opponent is doing. They have a deck. They're trying to make it function. There is some interaction in Caleb's cube, and you will note that if you listen to our our interview with him, his number one tip for people trying to spike the cube was draft interaction. Have that one lightning bolt in your deck because being able to remove that key piece of that key moment could be the difference between a win or a loss. So there is some interaction floating around, but there is definitely not from what I've seen a deck that is designed to like just stop their opponent, just control the game and, you know, win with some dinky creature. Everyone is winning with a very synergistic engine. That is the win condition of all these decks. The win conditions of the decks in my cube are largely attacking with whatever creatures you happen to have. Like, there's not not a ton of range to that win condition. No, it's obviously a huge range in terms of tempo. Are you killing them with small aggressive creatures, with a couple big control finishers, with mid-range creatures? But very different kind of win conditions in these cube decks. And it means that, frankly, there's not a lot of interactivity. There's not a lot of removal spells being thrown around. Like, a handful of game is what tends to, what, what it tends to come down to. It's largely a little bit of, like, my deck's doing my thing, your deck's doing your thing. We're going to see which one does its thing better. And from watching it, I, I, I think, I do believe that in some way that those synergistic decks can't really thrive in a space with a ton of interactivity. And there's two reasons why that is, I think. One of them is that those decks can't fit a ton of interaction in them, right? If your deck is a highly synergistic dredge deck, with which Caleb did draft a highly synergistic dredge deck, which is really, really cool, you don't have a lot of space for just putting a bunch of removal spells in there because your deck has to do its thing. You need enough 
creatures that do things in your graveyard. You need enough discard outlets. You need enough things that do stuff with your theme for any of those enablers to be powerful and turned on. For Bizarre of Baghdad to be any good. If your deck is just full of Doom Blades and Duresses, then your Bizarre of Baghdad's no good. Your whole deck doesn't even work. So I think that's one reason why the synergistic decks do suffer a little bit in high interactivity environments because they themselves can't play that much interaction. The other reason is that if it's an environment where everyone's playing a lot of interaction, I do think that a lot of these synergistic decks just wouldn't hold up because if you do, if you can very consistently remove very specific pieces, then a lot of these cool engines just break down and don't function anymore. Okay, sorry, I just uh, tried to clarify the question and then you did your whole monologue without me uh, uh, answering the question at all. Uh, I'm so bad at this. It's 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 hard. We'll, we'll be good at podcasting one day. So I think that you're highlighting on two sort of different definitions of what that interactivity is because my gut reaction was, of course, these aren't mutually exclusive or in some way opposed to each other because the more synergistic an environment is, the more relevant the interaction becomes in a lot of cases. If I'm trying to build this engine and I have a you know a young pyromancer in play and I'm trying to cast a bunch of spells to trigger it and make a bunch of tokens, the interactivity for you to be able to remove that one piece that actually then answers actually a whole bunch of my cards because they all depend on that one key piece being in play, then that interactivity is extremely relevant and important and uh, part of sort of the balance of the environment. Well... It might be, or it might be that you just ignore that and do your own thing bigger and faster. Sure, I could see that as well. But I'm just saying, like, it is it is not diametrically opposed in that the interactivity is not powerful or relevant. You can opt to right. draft the interactivity if it is present, and that be a viable strategy. But it does get a little bit more complicated there in that if there's too much, not, not from a, you know, what's happening within one game between two players... But what's happening in the whole environment at, from a design perspective, I do see that if the interactivity is preying on a lot of the synergy and the synergistic decks need to keep that key piece in play, you might actually, as a designer, deliberately tune down a lot of the interactivity in order to support that more synergistic environment. So I could see that from that sense, uh, you would say they are opposed from a little bit of a design philosophy perspective. Yeah, my, my question is really like, can both these things coexist? Can I have an environment that is in line with one of the like fundamental ways I like to play Magic, which is highly interactive. I don't like to not have an answer to the thing my opponent is doing. I don't just want to do my own game plan bigger and faster. I don't want to play these mutual games of Solitaire. I want to be making a lot of tough decisions. I, I did write down brief descriptions for these terms, definitions for these terms, because I think they are kind of fluffy. So for like a synergy deck, what I wrote down is your game plan is focused around combining cards in ways that makes them more than the sum of their parts. And a card's value is in relationship to the other cards in your deck. And if you watch Caleb play, he's always talking about all the little like connections and synergies he's woven through this cube where, oh, if I get this card and then I drop this other card, this thing will happen. If I get this card with this package, this other thing will happen. And he's always talking in respect to the deck he's drafting. He's never really talking about what his opponent is going to be doing. An interactive deck, by my definition, is a deck whose game plan is somewhat flexible and dependent on what their opponent is doing. What I'm going to do with my spells is dependent on what my opponent plays. A card's value, in that sense, is its relationship to the cards in your opponent's deck uh, as much or more so than, than in your own deck. Another good way to think about this is I think a synergistic deck, you could pretty faithfully goldfish. You could just sit down pull it up and, you know, see how fast it played out, see how quickly you got your engine online. You could imagine, okay, imagine my opponent has one removal spell and I've got the one I drew so I can answer one of their things. But you could, you know, pretty safely just sit down and goldfish it and get a sense for how the deck would play. I think a highly interactive deck from my cube, it's pointless to goldfish. You're like, all right, I got a bunch of removal spells in my hand. I have no idea. I guess turn one, I wait and see. Turn two, yeah. wait and see. Right. It's a ton. And it, to be clear, it's not just like control decks in my cube, though it certainly is more emphasized to control decks. That's also true of tempo decks. I've got all these burn spells and my Dreadheart Arcanist. I guess I'm burning stuff and attacking with Dreadheart Arcanist, I, I suppose is, is the plan. And so I think that that's another way you can think about it. It's like if you can goldfish it and get a sense for how the deck plays, then it's probably more synergistic. And if you can't, then it's probably more interactive in the sense that your deck is going to depend on what your opponent does to make its decisions. Just to avoid this being a bike shed moment, of course you can take a, a slightly more involved approach to goldfishing a deck and say, well, let's imagine my opponent plays a 1-1 on turn 1, a 2-2 two -two on turn 2, and some pattern like sure, that, yeah. and then uh, still goldfish a deck that way. But I, I think that your point makes sense when it's like, can I test if this plan can be executed is much harder if the plan is deal with my opponent's stuff, which is going yeah. to be a huge variety of things from game to game, from match to match. I've got an Eliminate, an Inquisition of Kozilek, and a Counterspell in my opening hand. I, I guess I... Do them. Feel good. Feel confident. Because <laughs> I do them and hope it hope it works. Uh, I do want to have one small note here, which is that 
I think some people might be listening and thinking, well, well, what about like interactive decks that hard lock their opponent out of casting spells, right? It's interactive in the sense that I'm setting up some infinite combo that, you know, removes all creatures constantly from play or an infinite combo that allows me to counter every spell, like the Guile Dovescape kind of combo or something like that. And I would say that those aren't interactive, even though they are technically interacting with your opponent because they don't care what your opponent does, right? No right. matter what your opponent's deck is, you just want to lock them out with your combo and counter all the spells. So it doesn't matter where the spells are. Right. Your linear plan could be, I'm going to turbo out Braids and Ophiomancer, which people love to do sometimes. Yeah. And also, I agree with you. These are definitely are not mutually exclusive at all, right? Like, I think it's kind of impossible, frankly, to design a magic environment where both aren't present to some degree, right? It'd be very difficult to come up with 360 cards where there was no synergy, where no card cared about another card and was made better by another card's presence. Basically impossible. Similarly, you could, I guess, build a cube that had zero interaction. That won't be easier to do, but you don't basically ever see that because it would be a really strange environment if there was literally no way to interact with any of your opponent's resources other than attacking or blocking. That would be strange. So I think these things are always present. What I'm picturing in my head is like, as you turn up one, the there's like a, a tension on the other where it can't go too high without being in balance. You can't have them both like fully maxed out if you're like imagining this from a design perspective. It's, it's the hypothesis I'm posing. I'm worried we're going to go into a rabbit hole about defining what does even like turning up interaction and turning up synergy even mean. I mean, especially when we talk about synergy, I, there are all kinds of different ways that we could define that. There is sort of this texture of like lots of small packages of cards that interact with each other. Or there's sort of the more linear synergy where it's just I have, you know, a a particular type of effect and I just want as many copies of this as possible. And I just don't know even how you talk about more and less synergy to it after a certain point. I think finding those terms is useful. So for me, more or less interactivity is pretty simply just more cards that interact with your opponent's resources. Attack their hand, attack their permanence, attack their spells on the stack, do something to stop or nullify or eliminate options from your opponent, just get rid of their resources. It's pretty easy to look at a spell and figure out if it's an interactive spell or not. Sure. I actually did this. I went through all nine decks that Caleb drafted from his cube and countered the interactive spells. I was curious to know, because I mean, the games played out certainly a lot less interactively than the games in my cube, but I didn't actually know how different the numbers would be and when you actually counted them out. So I did do that. I think the synergy is harder to define, right? I think it's much harder to define how much synergy is present in an environment. I think you and I both like, and I think most people that design cubes really like the idea of cards that get better when you draft other cards with them. If every draft pick was just choose the most powerful card in your color combination, maybe reading the table a little bit to see what's open, that would take a lot of the fun and joy out of drafting and deck building. I think right, everyone... I mean, that's, that's what really defines fun drafting is when you make a choice and then your other choices after that are different because of right. that first one. I think everybody likes that to some degree. And so I have tried to push that as much as I can within the bounds of my highly interactive environment, right? So what that means for me is that my synergistic pieces can't really be five mana cards and that don't do anything immediately because that's just not fast enough. It's too easy to counterspell. It's too easy to remove. So I, I do play, for example, a card like Dreadheart Arcanist, which we talked about a lot on this show. It's a card I love. It's a card Caleb also really loves. He drafted a Dreadheart Arcanist deck from his cube. It was his deck number three, for those of you looking it up on YouTube. And this deck actually looked a lot like a deck from my cube. I think I have almost every single card in this deck in my cube already. It's a deck you could basically draft from my cube if you wanted to. It was cheap threats, cheap uh, interactive spells. And this was the list with the most interactive spells that Caleb drafted with a total of 11 in the list that somehow interacted with. That's quite a bit. But that is quite a bit for sure. So when it comes to defining more synergistic environments, I think it comes down to how diverse the range of win conditions and kinds of deck you can draft are and how extreme of a build around can you actually support. There are a couple decks I mentioned here that uh, are completely alien to any deck I've ever seen drafted in any cube, certainly my own cube, that I thought were really interesting. The one I especially want to call attention to is uh, his draft number five, which uh, he calls my favorite deck of all time, and I can understand why. And this was basically a dredge deck. Uh, It was a deck that was built around Bazaar of Baghdad, and the whole goal was to get a bunch of your creatures into your graveyard, and then it had a bunch of ways to recur these things out of the graveyard, get a bunch of value, and basically grind his opponent out with these like really valuable synergistic loops. This deck has a total of four interactive spells in it, and that's being really generous in terms of the definition of interactive. I'm counting Priest of the Forgotten Gods because it can make your opponent sacrifice a creature, but that you know comes at a significant cost and can't always be done in a given board state. And I'm also counting Asmo, that really long-named guy that can sacrifice food to deal damage to stuff, which... In one game, Caleb did actually just mow down their opponent's entire board with Asmo activation. So wow. 
relevant, but also not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, turn on my opponent played a threat. I'll Asmo it to get rid of it. You can't do that. You have to have your engine online for those things to actually work. So only four active spells in this entire deck. It was still a total joy to watch him draft and play it because the way this deck functioned was beautiful. It was like a beautiful timepiece, fine timepiece, uh, how, how it was working out. And it was really cool to see these cards get abused that I don't often see played in cubes. But that to me is like one of the most synergistic decks he drafted. Every single card in that deck pretty much is in service of his theme. You know, three of the interactive spells are Asmo, Priest of the Forgotten Gods, and Bone Shards. Bone Shards, a discard outlet and a sacrifice outlet, which the deck already wanted. Really, the only card that wasn't synergistic from the interactive suite was Inquisition of Kozilek. Just, you know, a good spell to get rid mm-hmm. of your opponent's stuff out of their hand. Pretty much every other card in this deck is solely focused on this strategy. And that's why it works. I don't think you could have a deck that had this strategy as its identity and then had 10 interactive spells instead of four. Because I, I just don't think that the whole thing would work. I think you're hamstringing that synergy too much when you don't fully commit to it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I feel like there's a a challenge there that a lot of different types of decks can struggle with where you only have so many cards that you're going to draw throughout the game. So how do you actually get the density of things that that you need in order to make the deck function? We've talked a lot about, uh, especially like Equipments Matter is a theme that just from a design perspective, we've gotten a lot more tools of things like Barbed Spike and Ancestral Blade. Ancestral is Ancestral Blade. I mix up the blade sometimes. Mm Mm-hmm. And these kinds of effects, just, you know, by doubling up, let us get higher densities of multiple effects. In a, I mean, you even talked about Rimrock, Rimrock Knight, Knight exactly, yeah. as being an example of this. But for a lot of these more synergistic kinds of strategies that are like going really deep and at a power level where you need that synergy to really, really work to, to make the cards more than some of their parts in a huge way to compete the, the power level of the environment. I see your point there, I guess, is what I'm coming around to saying. Yeah. And, you know, that's not the only example, right? Uh, he drafted two different blue red storm decks that again abuse bazaar of baghdad which both involve like dumping led and a bunch of cards into their graveyard like past in flames and then either casting a yog will or an underworld breach and then casting led from the graveyard a bunch of times like the whole deck again was just very very focused on this particular strategy i mean I think storm is widely understood to be a strategy that requires a huge amount of commitment like if you're playing a storm deck you can't have a lot of cards in your deck that don't help with your storm count because the deck's not going to work. You need right. you need enough spells in order to storm off. I think that's true of other kinds of decks too. Another one, for example, uh, his deck number six was this uh, Tashar Loops combo deck, which used Tashar, Scrap Trawler, and a bunch of artifacts and artifact sack outlets to not go infinite to my memory, but to, again, kind of similar to that other deck. Go big enough. Go, Often you don't have to go infinite. Right. You just, just need to go big enough. a ton of value, recur things a bunch of times. Actually, no, this one did go infinite, I believe, a couple times now that I'm thinking back to it. So it does have some infinite loops there, actually. And again, that was an example, like six interactive spells in that deck, and that's including Pyrite Spellbomb, which is interactive for sure, but, you know, maybe not its primary use case in an artifact sacrifice deck. And, uh, you know, cards like Phyrexian Revoker, which is a very narrow kind of piece of interaction, but still interaction nonetheless. I think one of the things that is important to look at here is, in a lot of cases, the interactive spells that Caleb is running are also somehow connected to the theme of the deck, which I think is one of the ways you can maybe start to bridge this gap and make these two things coexist side by side. So in that Tashar deck, again, we have Pyrite Spellbomb, we also have Phyrexian Revoker, we have Walking Ballista. Those are all interactive spells that are in service of this Artifact Matters sack deck. We mentioned the Asmo and Bone Shards and Priest of Forgotten Gods from the Dredge deck. His least interactive deck he drafted, which you should definitely watch this draft if you're going to watch any of them. Well, maybe the fifth one if you can watch any of them. But the fourth one is also really good. It was an Earthcraft deck. I love an Earthcraft. I won't say Earthcraft combo because it didn't go infinite. It didn't have like Squirrel Nest or anything. But it was like really abusing Earthcraft and making a ton of tokens and then pretty much killing their opponent with Goblin Bombardment. This deck had three interactive spells, one of which was Goblin Bombardment, which again, it's like kind of interactive. Is it interactive or is that just the the combo piece? Right. It's kind uh, of I mean well it is kind of both, which is kind of in that interesting right. space that we're talking about. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things I'm now conscious of trying to do. And what keeps me from running a lot of the cards that are in this list that are both synergistic and interactive is that they're only conditionally interactive. Your Goblin Bombardment is not always interactive. You're not going to play Goblin Bombardment in a control deck. Your Priest of Forgotten Gods isn't always online. Sometimes you're going to have drawn your quote-unquote interaction, but not be able to interact with your opponent because you don't have enough creatures to sacrifice or whatever. And those are the kinds of conditional cards that I often shy away from in my own cube because I want to avoid those kinds of situations where the cards you drafted for a particular role don't perform that role in your deck. Yeah, I mean, I feel like also in a cube like yours, even though, you know, that that thing that we're talking about, the synergy that matters that when you make one choice in your draft, it's going to affect the decisions that follow. Mm -hmm. 
but not to maybe quite the same degree. You know, I, I can still look at a pack in your cube and say, well, these are the things that are probably not going to wield because they are just some of the more powerful effects. Whereas I'm looking at some of these decks in Caleb's cube and it's like, oh yeah, the Underworld Cookbook? Who else is going to want that unless they have this specific thing? And there might be a couple other places where it plays a role, but mm-hmm. it's like these more synergistic in like the narrow, more kind of packages of cards that go together, mm-hmm. you do have a, a lot of really, really extreme changes to your draft choices that that mean that what's going to come back to you on the wheel is something of a mystery, but also tells you a lot about what's going on at the table. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the reasons I avoid cards like this is because I think you have a much higher chance of kind of train wrecking a draft. I won't call this deck a train wreck, but I think if you look at deck eight of Caleb's, it's a good example of what can happen when you don't really get any of these synergistic packages. You don't fully commit to one kind of deck from the beginning. You're kind of drafting more, taking a little bit of this, a little bit of that. This deck is like a three three color deck with some splashes that is kind of vaguely a lands deck. You know, it has like exploration and molten vortex, but not really a lands deck. He ended up passing a lot of lands cards in the draft because he thought lands wasn't open. And the deck, you know, played fine. Caleb's a skilled player. He got wins with it. But it was definitely the kind of deck where it's like, this is not a kind of deck I want to support. This is just kind of a pile of cards that kind of do stuff together, but do not represent a full commitment to a like synergistic build around strategy like some of the other decks we've mentioned. Right. And, and I think that a key piece there is in your cube, just to keep using it as, as an example, you focus really hard on making sure that cards have a very high floor. They don't yeah. really fail, which means if you have a reasonable curve, you have enough fixing, you're going to be able to play your game and, and it'll be fine. Here, you really can have a lot of cards that just don't function if, if you don't have the pieces to support them, which you know, that has pros and cons. It's it's nice to sort of have that reassurance of, okay, I know I, I can't train wreck too bad, but you don't get necessarily those high highs uh, or the really exciting moments of things coming together. Hey, everybody, it's Andy doing that thing I do where when I'm editing the show, I wish I had said a thing, so I come back and say it later. As a comparison point, I did count up the number of interactive spells in a couple of recently drafted decks from my own cube to compare to Caleb's. So just for reference, a, uh, a recent black-green rock deck in my cube had 10 interactive spells. A blue-white tempo deck had 12. The least interactive deck I could find from recent drafts of my cube is this Sultai mid-range deck, which has five interactive spells. Something else we didn't mention in this episode is that a lot of times certain decks can play really creatures as their interaction. You know, a mid-range deck like that, and at least in my cube, its answer for aggro is just playing beefy blockers that aggro can't attack through, which reduces their reliance on like single target removal spells. So it's got a couple things in there to mess with control decks or take key pieces away, but pretty much just relying on being a proactive deck with big blockers. Then I found two recent control lists that had 16 and 17 interactive spells, which means that Basically, every non-land card pretty much is a cantrip or an interactive spell of some sort. That's what the control decks tend to look like in my cube. Caleb's, by comparison, were in order 9 interactive spells, 5, 11, 3, 4, 6, 4, 7, and 6. So definitely a big difference in the numbers, not just a difference in the experience of playing those environments. The last thing I wanted to add is that listening back to this conversation, it's one thing is kind of obvious to me, which is that I do have some synergistic cards in my cube. They just tend to be the synergistic cards that work with the efficient and reliable removal suite that I like to run. So if you look at cards like Dreadhorde Arcanist or Murktide Regent or Thing in the Ice or the various Delve spells, Cast Dissident Mage, all these cards work a lot better with a bunch of cheap, plentiful interaction. And so... So yeah, I think I think really it's a matter of navigating the right kind of synergy and the right kind of interaction for the environment you are trying to craft. Okay, back to the show. And uh, you know, I made one change to my cube this week that was largely inspired by Caleb's cube and also inspired by some conversations we had in the Discord, which was uh, I swapped out Vivian, the five man Vivian. I can't remember her name. The five man Vivian Planeswalker for Titania Protector of Argoth because. Frankly, Vivian in my cube is pretty much playing as like a slightly worse Nissa who shakes the world. Like they both made three threes, but Nissa's other abilities were more relevant. Her starting loyalty was higher. It was like Nissa was the big payoff in terms of green planeswalkers, like big green threats. And Vivian was like the next best one. And in that role, like I, I, that brings no joy to me. I don't want a card that's just kind of like the next best version of another card in the cube. And so adding Titania, which is more of a build around card, right? Like it's still got, I think in my environment, a fairly high floor because most decks that are not mono green will be able to buy back a fetch land with Titania, which will effectively give them two five threes for their five mana investment, which is quite a bit. 
but it does have this really long tail of like, you can combine it with Elvish Reclaimer. You can combine it with Knight of the Reliquary. You can combine it by getting back your own Wasteland and Wastelanding your own non-basic and making two more 5-3s. You can combine it with the Horizon Lands to sacrifice themselves. You can combine it with a lot of stuff to turn it from a like reasonably high value finisher to like a huge bomb that immediately ends the game if you can if you can pull it off. And I'm excited to have that range. Looking at this cube, watching these games play out, I was like, oh, you know what? I don't need to have every card be purely in service of my like fundamental drive and magic. Cause I do also like the, the synergistic stuff. I love these decks Caleb drafted. It was a joy to watch him play them, even though the games are not what I would describe as the kind of games that I'm aiming for with my own environment. I think that's a great shift in focus. I mean, those kinds of moments and those kinds of cards and interactions are fun and we should support them if, if that's what we're looking for. Ultimately, this comes down to the question of like, can a cube be everything? <laughs> Which is, which I think is a really interesting topic. And I know I felt this pressure a lot when I only had one cube. It was like, all right, well. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we solved that problem pretty easily. <laughs> I think the answer is maybe, but probably not. But you're asking the wrong problem. You're asking the wrong question. Just have multiple cubes. How many do we have in the play group at this point? Well, we have more cubes than we have players, for sure. No doubt. Uh, when you start counting it up. Because most players in our play group have a cube and many of us have multiple. So they're outnumbering us. That's true. I, having extra cubes is great if you can do it. But we know from making the show and getting questions from people over email that like a lot of people can't even really get over the hurdles of just making their own first cube. That's a big hurdle for somebody to get all the cards together, design it, get the sleeves together, put yeah, it in a box, a get project. someone to draft it. It's a huge project. Having multiple is, is a really big ask. And so for a lot of people that have their one cube, I think it's reasonable to want to get a little bit of everything they love about magic into that cube environment. That's, I think, a, a reasonable goal within a certain amount of limitations. You know, I, I, I do think there's some limits to how much you can have everything in the same environment. But this little case study of, you know, I have two green fives. There's only two green fives in my entire cube. Having them both be like very different kinds of green fives, such that if you arrive at this card in a pack and you're playing green, there's plausible reasons why you would really want one or the other, right? It's not just like if you see Vivian and Nissa in, a, in the same pack, you're like, oh, I'm always taking Nissa because Nissa is just better than Vivian. And they do kind of the same thing. They're both these incremental value engines. And I like Planeswalkers for all the reasons we mentioned, right? Like, I think they both have a higher floor than Titania. They both are provide this like incremental advantage, which is not blowouty, right? Like again, Titania could just win the game immediately, just make five five threes in one turn. And then your opponent's like, great, I should have kept my lightning bolt up and now I just lose where that's not going to happen with a Planeswalker, right? They're very incremental. They're very, like, one step at a time. Your opponent has multiple means of interacting with it. I don't know. The number of times my opponent's played a Planeswalker and I've thought, now I lose, it's going to take four turns, but uh, that's kind of the game. That happens to me pretty often. I find that I answer Planeswalkers in my cube more than I lose to them when I'm they very, resolve. I'm very impressed. Great job. <laughs> this specifically is one where it's like, I always get that gut feeling like, oh, this is going to be bad. And then it's like, actually, you can kind of... Getting rid of that creature land is valuable. It turns you know, a removal spell into a removal spell and a, a right. stone rain. And then you can oftentimes get in there and they're actually at a little bit of a disadvantage. Anyway, I think having that range is, is really compelling. And I'm certainly looking at other places in my cube where I have what is right now kind of redundancy that could be an opportunity for more range in the kinds of supported decks and supporting more of that synergy. Because we've talked about like Dreadhold Arcanist, one of my favorite cards, because it's synergistic. It, because it rewards you for drafting a specific kind of deck. And you can't have absolutely explosive turns with a Dreadheart Arcanist that are very memorable. Yeah, I will never forget uh, casting Dalmry's Ambush in, in the draft of War of the Spark. Casting Dalmry's oh, Ambush on my uh, Dreadheart Arcanist and then, you know, attacking, flashing, flashing it, back. it back. Basically plague winding my opponent on turn three or four uh, and, and, and three five. Uh, do, you, do you remember that card has trample too? Just yes, so if you do, do have to put a bunch of trample. counters on it. <laughs> they want you to make it big and get in there. I feel like they put trample on it partially because they wanted to say, play this with combat tricks. Because yes. a lot of new yeah. players probably wouldn't think that. They'd be like, oh, this is for flashing back. Who knows what they would think. It's just, But also, they might not realize that it's so good with combat tricks because of the fact that you can then flash back a bigger right. spell with it. I think that's awesome. Just designed to like play sure, that little absolutely. seed that kind of directs you. It's like when you're playing Mario and they just put a couple coins in a direction where it's like, oh, let me go see what's over here. And then it leads you to something important. Just little suggestions. You've been playing a lot of Mario? No. A weird reference is all. I think about Mario a lot. <laughs> okay. Sure, why not? I played the new, Kirby, said Breath of the I played Wild. The new Kirby game and that was, okay. had similar design uh, sort of features. Okay, that counts. We'll count that. I think another little interesting detail is thinking about where in your cube do you really need that redundancy and where can yeah. you really, without affecting the environment negatively, whatever that means for your design goals, can you actually just put in more variety? And I think that in a lot of contexts, just focusing on like 
or especially on the more expensive spells, yeah. is often where you can just put a lot of variety because a lot of expensive magic cards are powerful. They will do something. So having them be, you know... I mean expensive in terms of mana, just correct. to be clear. Yeah. Yes. That's probably not always going to be true. There might I mean, be some... some exchange that, rate between how much mana you spend and board impact or like game impact of a card. I think that's right. reasonable to, to make across the board. I, I would say even maybe not just expensive spells, but especially like threats, I think, at the like mid and higher part of the curve. You know, I don't really want to have conditional counter spells or removal spells in my in my cube although i did just add lethal scheme which i think fits into this description very nicely i cut ultimate price doom blade that destroys a monocolored creature for lethal scheme which is this new card which i think is going to have a much lower floor and a much higher ceiling and does require some drafting and building around you want cheap creatures you want tokens you want to care about the graveyard somehow you want all these things to make lethal, lethal scheme better that you don't care about if you draft ultimate price that's just a two mana get rid of a creature with bugging you kind of card I, I, in general i think that yeah, the threats are a great place to put that because a five mana card, or let's, let's exaggerate more, a seven mana card should win you the game. There's probably a lot of seven mana cards that'll win you in the game. In your cube, for sure. I think, in most cubes. I think, I mean, in retail limited, a seven mana card should win you the game. Depends on the format. <laughs> I think most of the time it's the, that's the does, case. Does Meteor Golem win you the game? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Yeah, card was kind of messed up in M19 limited or whatever it was. Given that, given that, you know, if you're playing a seven mana threat, its role in some abstract sense is pretty limited it's win the game it's be some like incredible threat that uh is going to take over i think there you can afford to make that threat a little more fun and interesting by providing this range right like again in my cube if you resolve any five mana green spell should you be a little bit favored probably you know if you resolve a vivian versus a titania how often is the game going to be fundamentally different because of that i'm not entirely sure how much the outcome is going to be changed by switching from vivian to titania but i do know that titania is going to have these more explosive story moments, these more interesting draft decisions where you say, I'm going to make a lands deck now because I have all these ways to trigger Titania or whatever. That does add texture, even if at a macro level, the outcomes of the games or the power level of the decks aren't really affected. Right, yeah. Do you think about this for your own regular cube? Do you feel this tension between synergistic build around cards and decks that are committed to a very specific game plan and highly interactive magic that kind of pull in the opposite directions? Do you not feel that at all? So I definitely think about these two aspects a lot. And I definitely would say, compared to your cube at least, uh, I focus a little bit more on synergy. I'm a little bit more okay with cards that have a lower floor. You know, I I have cards like Phalanx Leader, the heroic card, which at its floor, it's a really hard to cast two mana one one, uh, which is not what you want to be doing. Because I do appreciate those high highs where you get to cast a bunch of spells on it and make your huge board and and take over, uh, which I really enjoy those. And I do see, I I think especially one of the sort of axes of tension that I see is if I turn the interaction up too much, it's just not worth playing that because you know a, an arc lightning will just destroy your whole plan if, yeah, if uh, arc lightning real good against the heroic deck but it's also awesome in the heroic deck which that's is that's true why i love <laughs> that's it that's kind of um, attention so i think that that's one thing i'm trying to balance but there is also some of this challenge that we've also talked about about cam- how much interaction can you actually fit in a very synergistic deck which i haven't thought about as much but i think is is relevant and important do you think you favor like me the in general more reliable interaction or do you think that there is a big appeal to the more conditional and like you have to jump through some hoops in order to make this interaction work kind of interaction i i personally i feel like this is an unpopular opinion but i kind of love the conditional interaction i love an oblivion ring for the opportunity that you can oblivion ring is not conditional that's not what i'm talking about okay i mean things like asmo or priest of forgotten gods i mean oblivion gets rid of anything yes someone can then answer that answer that's not what i mean i mean like interaction that does not work unless you have done some other stuff to get that interaction piece to be live i would say still yes i mean combat tricks are can we classify combat tricks as I this think we like definitely can you can definitely turn them into removal but you have to figure out how to set it up or uh something like iron craig pyromancer is a card that i really love whenever you draw your second spell you get to bolt something and it's fun to play a deck with cheap cantrips and turn all your cantrips into lightning bolts and set up can i actually do this for my opponent's turn for value so, I, yeah, I think that in in the same way that I enjoy synergistic cards, and I like picking cards that are proactive and powerful when you put them together, putting cards together that are reactive in a more powerful way is equally fun, I think. Yeah, and some other examples of these kind of build-around interactive spells, for lack of a better word. Caleb has Conflagrate in his cube and played it in one of his Storm decks, which is definitely a removal spell that you really have to be in a particular kind of deck before you can make any use of that. 
Another one is Molten Vortex, which really, again, you don't want to just play Molten Vortex in any old deck as a means of removal. You want to play that in a deck that is highly committed to doing the lands thing, recurring a bunch of lands, has life from a loam, and it's going to be able to turn that into a very potent card. So I'm, again, I'm not even sure. I think you're right to have alluded to earlier the fact that a lot of these cards kind of verge on the edge of like combo piece instead of piece of interaction. Gomba Barman being another example. Gomba Barman can be used as interaction. You can use it to kill your opponent's combo card, but it's not really why you put it in your deck. You put it in your deck because it's how you're going to turn your extremely valuable engine into a game-winning combo. Although I'd be curious how it would play out. You know, there's so much player bias that maybe we just don't see the rest of that space. One example that I've experienced on my own cube is Mortar Pod, which just is a similar card that lets you throw around a little bit of damage. And it was in my cube for a while before anyone played it, but then someone did and realized this is kind of busted. Like, not busted, but whenever it's in play, it always feels relevant. And there's always ways I can, you know, set up another attack because that one damage is going to matter or prevent a block or set up multiple effects in one turn to be able to kill something. Mortar so, Pod, good. I think that's a similar kind of thing where it's like, this doesn't just say destroy target creature, but if you can set it up, if you have uh, enough fodder for it or can set up another situation through combat, it can become this sort of conditional situational removal, which is fun to find those paths to, to make it work. A similar one to that is uh, Mono Skellion is a card that Caleb has in his cube, which similarly, you know, it's a two mana 2-2 two, two that you can essentially ping something once. You know, it's got some other stuff going on. But that's basically what it is. That is a card that he values quite highly in his cube that he thinks is quite powerful because that one damage is really relevant to him. Similarly, Lava Dart is a card he really values because that one damage is really important. Here's an interesting one in terms of like narrow interaction. He has Spell Stutter Sprite in, is it most of the decks he drafted? He always ends up with Spell Stutter Sprite because no one else is taking it. Everyone else is like, why is this card here? There's clearly no fairies theme. Why is Spell Stutter Sprite in the cube? And Caleb is firmly of the opinion that it's just a really good piece of interaction because there are so many one mana spells that are relevant in this environment. He just plays it in a deck. In his first deck he drafted, it's basically mono black except for exactly spell starter sprite. He splashes for spell starter sprite because he believes amazing. it's so good. And, you know, from watching the games play out, like he gets people with it kind of often. I, I'm not convinced that it's worth the two mana to have a spell starter sprite. I'm not really seeing what else it's synergistic with, I guess, besides sacrifice themes, I suppose. But that's a narrow piece of interaction that I think shines in this environment, or at least Caleb seems to make work pretty efficiently. That is really interesting, but uh, that's also very cool. I mean, I was looking at it and I was like, I have a ton of one mana spells. I got more than Caleb has by ratio. Like, is this card good in my cube? But then we have to ask, is it even if it's good for players as a designer, are players going to enjoy it? Are they going to play it? Or is they it just going to sit board in sideboards? <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to play my spell starter sprite except for me or Caleb whenever he plays my cube. <laughs> Where do we land here, Anthony? I still feel like there is a fundamental tension and that these things can't be both fully maxed out in your design. You can't have a cube that is focused on extremely interactive magic and also have these really synergistic decks like the LED Bazaar of Baghdad Storm deck and the Dredge deck and the Tashar Loops deck be existing in the same environment. But I do think that I have learned something from watching all these games play out in Caleb's cube and thinking about it, which is that I think there are more opportunities in my 360 cards to get some more builder and stuff in there without sacrificing my overall interactive thrust. Can I ask maybe a stupid question or a really obvious question? Can I not just say in this environment, blue and black are extremely reactive and white and green are just totally proactive? How about Caleb's cube? In, in some abstract cube, can I not just say literally... If you want these two styles of deck, both of them are present in different colors, or you think that they're... The question is just, do they... How does that game play out then? I guess is what it comes down. When they meet up in, in the bracket, what happened? I mean, probably black and blue win, but that's that's what magic players want to see, right? He makes Bridge from Below look broken in this cube. In the uh, in the deck number five he drafted with the uh, Bizarre Baghdad, like the, basically the Dredge deck, like he makes Bridge from Below look incredibly messed up. And that's a card that... I would have guessed you couldn't really make work in a singleton drafted environment, and he just makes it look effortless. Bridge from below. Card's weird. Card's weird. That card basically screams future sight. So do you think there is an inherent tension there, or do you think this is all me just wringing my hands and uh, you know trying to have my cake and eat it too? I think there is some tension there, but I think a lot of it maybe has more to do just with it's hard to make a cube that is doing everything all at once. You can't say, here are the 400 mechanical themes that I love in Magic, and I want every single one of them to be drafted in this one cube. That's just going to be hard to fit in there. So to have both the 
really extreme all reactive decks. I mean, let's even get more more specific. We just say specifically in the red section of my cube, I want to support both the most extreme form of a reactive deck and the most extreme form of a synergistic proactive deck. And it's just not going to be enough cards to fit both of those. So in the sort of traditional what we are thinking of as cube, for now, I do see that there's a challenge there just in terms of yeah. space. The amount of space in the cube is a really important question too. I mean, that kind of is the same question of amount of space in your deck, like just distilled down. But I do actually have a synergistic list I started working on like six months ago or so. You can find it on my cube Pro. Maybe it's not published. I don't know. Maybe it's a secret list. Maybe you can't find it. Which, um, you know, actually bears a fair bit of resemblance to Caleb's cube, minus all the power and minus all the broken cards. In that I was like, can I build a synergistic cube that cares about the kind of things I value in magic, like a really low curve and emphasizing interactivity wherever I can. And I definitely felt this tension of like, all right, I've got all these cool synergistic pieces I wanted to put in the cube. And now I've got like no slots left to put interaction in. So I guess I just put some in and call it a day. But like definitely felt this tension of like, where do I even put this interaction? If I want to have all these packages and synergistic groups of cards supported, you just run out of space in the cube. Just make the cube bigger. Drive four packs. Maybe that's the key to everything, Anthony. Keep calm and make the cube bigger. Because if it was bigger, then you definitely could have enough space for both and players could theoretically choose to commit one or the other and just have, you know, 20 dead draft picks that they don't care about because it wasn't either their fully synergistic pick or their fully interactive pick. I don't know. I think that's kind of uh, I think that's kind of giving up, actually. It's not the key. That's that's throwing in the towel. I don't think so. I that's, think you can make the cube bigger. That's like saying, you know, uh, how do you, I you yourself have cubes where you make the deck smaller? And uh, in some cases, a lot smaller, which is kind of similar. I guess no, there you also scale the That's list. the opposite, because there you have less, even less cards, right? Like mm-hmm. you, yes, your deck is consistent, but you don't have room for multiple different packages of things because you have so few cards to work with. You know, it's similar in some ways, but actually very different in other ways. I don't know. I feel like that's saying, uh, you know, I'm trying to make this most delicious dish. How do I make it better? And it's like, uh, just have bigger. more of it. Just have more. <laughs> I think that's a great solution. <laughs> You can't say in good faith you think that's a great solution. You eat like a little mouse. You have you eat like reasonable portions all the time. I'm the pig that just I eat stuffs like a my satisfied face. mouse. Yeah. So I will say I think that the bigger cube is maybe not the solution because not of of size but time. I think a, a, a normal draft of about 45 cards takes a reasonable amount of time, and I don't necessarily want to draft for longer than that. It takes a lot longer when you got some people that just take a long time to make picks. Is that fire to me? No. Okay. We've been playing every week at the LGS with uh, new people we've not played with before, and. I, it's a joy. I love doing it. You've done a great job specifically at like getting people to come out for cube night and like try a new format. I definitely feel like, oh boy, this draft takes twice as long or three times as long as it would take if it were like all people that knew the cube and were just drafting as quickly as they could. I think I draft too quickly. I think I play magic too quickly too. Mm-hmm. I'm impatient. I gotta like slow down and take my time more. I gotta speed up and also do better at the same time. How do I do that? Is that practice, that's practice, similar? Practice. That's similar to that tension. Can I do both of those at once? No, I can't fit can't solve both uh maybe if you did a bunch of adderall or something i don't don't know okay all right that's gonna do it for this episode of lucky paper radio i really want to know if you all have opinions on the decks drafted from caleb's cube i saw quite a few people like really excited by this cube and wanting to build clones of it or cubes very similar to it you know i think caleb by virtue of his high visibility and by virtue of having designed a really cool and interesting cube is going to make shake up i think what cubes are in a pretty substantial way one thing i noticed which i did not expect is that the majority i would say the majority of caleb's opponents recognize his username and know that it's his cube which if you that is cool right it's not like i would have guessed that most magic online players never read the, the blog never know what cubes coming they just you know sign in see if the thing they can do and decide if they want to do it or not but it seems like actually most of them knew who he was and knew it was his cube, which I did not expect. I would have thought there was this long tail of people that just aren't even involved in any of the worlds we're in and are just like playing magic for fun when they get a couple of bit of time off work or whatever. But maybe not. Maybe we're all really invested in this hobby. We're all here together. It's really hard to tell what the world looks like in this world where we're all highly online and everything is anonymous and scale is impossible to see. I was talking to a friend this week about her social media presence. and She said... It's really hard to know how to be. And I said, yeah. Yeah. It is really hard to know really how to be. That's a really good point. Yeah. It's really hard to know mm-hmm. how to be. I totally agree. 21 weeks to CubeCon. We got to figure out something fun to say about the week to count down to CubeCon. Uh, blackjack. <laughs> okay. I think you... Oh, you go on. Let's do it. I'll say 21 weeks to CubeCon. You say a Blackjack. No, I was going <laughs> to... <laughs> you don't want to do it? You're going to back out now? Yeah. 
I think KubeCon is almost a little bit of a misnomer. I know we're talking to the Cube people here, but I feel like this is more just like DraftCon. You know, we've talked yes. about how what is yes. fun about Magic for a lot of us is just diving into a brand new format that hasn't been solved before. Hasn't It's just brand new. You get to explore it and try and do your best. And I think that this is that's what this is going to be. If you're the kind of person that maybe you're not into Cube, but you just love to draft a new format for the first time, this is going to be a weekend of nonstop that. So come to DraftCon. I think the next KubeCon should be some sort of light pyramid scheme where everybody that owns a cube, <laughs> everybody that owns a cube that is currently in KubeCon's audience in orbit should be responsible for bringing seven friends that do not own cubes and just want to play magic. And then we have mm-hmm. the right ratio. I wouldn't call that a pyramid scheme. I would call that event planning. Well, I was imagining that if you bring seven people, your ticket's paid for by the percentage of all the money from the seven people you How are you going to enforce that? Software, Anthony. Beautiful software. Oh, of course. <laughs> software that solves <laughs> problems. Beautiful, the- simple software. I hope there are people at KubeCon that have never designed a cube, maybe have never played a cube and just came because they wanted to play. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I really hope that's the case. I hope so too. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This show is produced by me watching a video on Kib's YouTube channel as I fall asleep most nights for the past week and just thinking about how my cube could be more fun. Thanks for talking about magic with me, Anthony. Thanks for talking about magic with me, Andy. And thanks again to Donald K. Magic for helping us with those annotations and everyone else who I know is considering doing it in the future. Preemptive thanks. The other thing about Titania, like a $1.50 retro border foil. You ever just get the sense that like you value a card more than the market and you just want to acquire a bunch of them? Yes. This happened to me with Bubbles of Citadel. We're like, I'm not an MTG finance person. I personally think that if you're a person that makes a living by just speculating on assets, you are the lowest kind of person and I hate you. But... Wow. Hot take. It's I, I don't think it's that hot. It's uh, disgusting behavior. But I did find myself... Uh, I love Bulbs of Citadel from the first time I saw it. It was like a card I was totally obsessed with. And for a long time, the like promo foil, which I think has the coolest art of all the retro- of all the Bulbs of Citadels, was like two bucks. And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to... This is worth more than $2 to me. So if I see one for $2, I'm just going to get it. And by that method, I ended up with like, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them. I got quite a few. But I'm not going to sell them. I have, no, I have no exit plan. I'm not an MTG Finance bro. I have a Judge promo, fell on the third path. I don't actually know. Is that worth something now? It was not expensive when I got it, and I delight in it. Get 10. No, one's good.